Nice to be back at the 92nd Street Y. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So glad everybody is here. This is going to be a fun, fun night. Welcome to Magic Moments, an evening celebrating the music of Hal David and remembering Hal David tonight. And I think everybody here would certainly agree that it would be pretty much impossible to encapsulate Hal's incredible body of work and his entire career in the short time we have here tonight. But we're going to make the most of it. And we're going to be bringing you some insights, some highlights, uh, some music, of course, and some moments through the words of Hal's wife and constant companion, the lovely Eunice David. We're so happy she's here, as well as a few women who have interpreted Hal's amazing lyrics over the years, including, of course, couldn't do the show without the incomparable Dionne Warwick. She'll be out here shortly. But right now, why don't we get things rolling and make the most use of our time and let us bring on uh, the woman of the evening. Would you please give a warm 92nd Street Y welcome to Eunice David. Excellent. How fun is this? I this love is, it already. Well, this is particularly cool for me, and, and I'll just tell you very quickly. Obviously, as a self-proclaimed musicologist, uh, I'm, I've always been an admirer of Hal David's work over the years. But in full disclosure, Eunice has known me since I was a small child. So it's like a double privilege for me being here with you tonight. And, I, and, and you're all grown up now. I love well, being with you. It, it is really uh, great that we were able to do this together. I will point out, in addition to telling these great stories, a lot of which are uh, seen in uh, Eunice's great new book. Uh, she also put together this terrific slideshow that's going to help us through the evening with some terrific pictures, some great music. And Eunice, of course, just had to learn the remote control setup system for this whole computer here. So uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you we'll give me a lot of confidence. See how that goes. <laughs> uh, obviously, the catalyst for tonight's program is this great book you've written. And it really does take us on such a, a wild ride. Well, it was wonderful for me to be able to write the book. Uh, Hal and I had an absolutely incredible 25 years together. It was, we traveled, we did a lot of work for ASCAP. I was always with Hal when he was traveling for ASCAP and for songwriters, for the benefit of songwriters. And we just had a great time together. And I have to imagine, long before you ever knew Hal, you admired his work and his work with Bert. How did you guys meet? <laughs> well, actually, I admired their songs, but I didn't know that they were their songs. I thought Bert had written all of them. <laughs> we, <laughs> Hal and I were both widowed, and mutual friends in Los Angeles asked us to play mixed doubles tennis. And being an LA gal with my own car, I said, well, all right, I'll go and meet this other guy, but I'm uh, taking my own car in case I have to make a quick getaway. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. The fellow I met, I thought his name was Hal Davis. I mean, that was my first mistake. He corrected that quickly. Then I said, well, what do you do? <laughs> he said, I, I write songs. I said, well, would I know any of them? <laughs> he said, well, there's a book with my lyrics. I'll see that you get a copy of it. So it really wasn't until the next day that I know, knew who I had played tennis with, Hal David. So I, I called my younger son, Donald, who was living in Boston at the time. I said, you know, I just met this really nice guy, but he has a strange profession. He's a songwriter. <laughs> I said, you know the song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, Don't You? And Donald said, oh, Mom, don't tell me you're dating Burt Backrack." <laughs> Well, Donald and I both thought that Bird had written all those songs, and that was one of the motivations for my writing this book. I wanted people to know the great advantage that the songs have with a wonderful lyricist, and Hal was certainly one of those wonderful lyricists. And what a fun life you guys had together. I mean, really exciting. Uh, all of the songwriting events, Hal, of course, uh, working at ASCAP and the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and what I love in the book is you take us all over the world. You guys really shared a passion for travel. Take us into those worlds. <laughs> well, we did. Actually, before Hal passed, we realized that we had been every single place in the world that we ever wanted to go. So that was a good way <laughs> to end his life. But starting when we first met, 
I went to all of the uh, songwriting events that he went to. He was frequently called upon to be a judge of the song festivals in Asia, in South America, in Hong Kong, all over the place. And I was lucky enough to go with him and have those experiences with him. And as far as our travels were concerned, we, we just went every place, as I mentioned, we wanted to go, including six safaris, our favorite kind of a trip. But Hal was president of ASCAP, and he, he not only was a wonderful songwriter, but he was a great businessman. And I learned that ASCAP made great strides while Hal was at its helm. Uh, Paul Williams, who is now the president of ASCAP, called Hal a warrior. He was an advocate for songwriters and frequently walked the halls in Washington, D.C., uh, helping to get copyright laws extended and improved. And people, songwriters can thank him and their heirs can thank him for many years to come. It, it really is incredible that his legacy, everybody knows the music and the songs, uh, but that really is such an important part of his legacy. It was. It really and the other thing Hal loved, he was chairman of the board of Songwriters Hall of Fame, and he just enjoyed the annual uh, galas. Uh, I think uh, Linda Moran is in the audience tonight. She's now the president of Songwriters Hall of Fame, and their annual gala is going to be Thursday of this week. So that's something that I'm looking forward to. So where did it all start for him? Obviously, you went from not even knowing this is the guy who wrote all those incredible songs, to knowing everything about his entire career. What was the very beginning of the songwriting career for Hal? Hal, well, first of all, I want to show you this picture of uh, Hal's family. Uh, there were three boys in the family and one girl who wasn't born yet when this picture was taken. But Hal was the baby, as you can see on his father's lap. And this is a picture of Hal as the editor of his school paper. He was always writing songs, poems. That was what he loved to do. But he was influenced by his older brother, Mac David, who wrote songs like Bibbidi Bobbidi Do Boo, It's Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom Time, I Don't Care If the Sun Don't Shine. He was a great songwriter, but he discouraged Hal from going into that field. He thought Hal was a great writer and maybe he should go into advertising. So listening to his older brother, he took a job, an intern job as a copy boy in the New York Post. And that's, that was his, uh, the extent of his advertising career. <laughs> From there, he was drafted into the Army. That's where he first started. He, um, I, he whoops, I forgot to tell you one thing, that when uh, Hal's family lived in Brooklyn, and they had a delicatessen and restaurant. And Hal sliced his fair share of salami when he was helping his parents. And I think you're going to hear, hear just a little bit yes. more about that from AJ in a moment. But when Hal got into the Army, then he learned that um, they needed songwriters, uh, people who could write stories. They needed people, actors, dancers, singers, for army shows that were going to be sent all over the South Pacific. And Hal applied for that job immediately and got transferred out of the infantry <laughs> and into there. And uh, that's where his, uh, his music career started. Well, I, I don't know if this is what the army had in mind, but <laughs> I, I love this. This is one of the lyrics I have here uh, that Hal wrote while he was in the army, and I'm guessing most people are not aware of this particular lyric, or quite frankly, what a big hit it actually <laughs> was over there in the Pacific where Hal was stationed, but, but I, I will read it now. <laughs> and I do uh, keep in mind the, the delicatessen reference that, thank you for mentioning that. Here's what Hal wrote. Send a salami to your boy in the army. It's the patriotic thing to do, that everyone should do. Send a salami to your boy in the army. Don't send him things to wear, Send him something he can chew. Uh, I, I don't know that that lyric particularly foreshadowed the great lyricist he became, although I have to say, it takes a lot of guts to, to try to rhyme army and salami. Little army. And you, you pull it off. And yet, so you have to love the Delhi influence. What was his army experience like? Because I, I know you cement relationships. I mean, my dad, being in the army, he talks about the guys he served with or, or that he was stationed with, uh, you well, know, and, and 
and it just stays with you for life. That's true. The major of their outfit was uh, the Shakespearean actor Maurice Evans. He was British, but by that time he was an American citizen, so he was drafted into the Army. And there he was, head of that group. Others who were in the group were um, Carl Reiner, with whom Hal remained friends throughout his life, um, uh, Alan Ludden, who was married to Betty White. Uh, there were a whole bunch of young kids who wanted to be in showbiz, and many of them really made it. Howie Morris was one of them. Uh, Werner Klemper, they had a whole group, and they wrote and performed in those shows that went all over the South Pacific. And whenever anyone like Bob Hope or the other performers who uh, helped out in World War II, whenever they came through Honolulu, they stopped by to see Major Evans, and Hal got to meet them also. So he was very excited, but he had a good Army career. <laughs> and then he headed back, uh, and he got his songwriting uh, started in earnest, uh, I guess. The minute he came back to New York, he decided he wasn't going to listen to his older brother. He wanted to write songs. So that's what he did. He just went door to door, knocking on doors, looking for opportunities. And that's how, that's how he got started. OK, so to give you time frame now, we're at 1946, and that's when Hal actually recorded his first song. And you know Hal's songs, obviously, and you don't think of him as a controversial lyricist. However, uh, his very first song that was recorded actually did cause a bit of controversy, and, and it'll be obvious why, I think. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Why don't we listen to a bit of this? Well, the song was called Horizontal. It was recorded by, <laughs> by <laughs> you get an idea already, right? <laughs> it was recorded by Pat Flowers with music by Lou Ricca. <laughs> filthy, filthy mind, or was it? <laughs> OK, the story behind it was that Hal came home from the, from the Army exhausted. He was a soldier who wanted to get some rest. He just wanted to go to bed and stay there. <laughs> Obviously, it was taken the wrong way. Pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> pretty, pretty innocent, as it turns out. Uh, the controversy did not deter Hal from forging ahead with his songwriting yeah. career. And he wrote a series of hits after that with several different composers. Walk us through some of who they were and what well, songs they One of the first songs uh, that Hal wrote after he got out of the Army uh, it was, became a major hit in 1949. He met a fellow by the name of Don Rodney, who worked with Guy. He was a, gu a guitarist with Guy Lombardo's band. And they got together. Hal wrote the lyrics, which he titled uh, The Four Winds and the Seven Seas. And Don took the lyrics to work with him that night when he was performing with the band. And in between band breaks, he finished writing the music to the song. And it wasn't until the next day when they were called in to the um, publisher's office that Hal heard, heard the song for the first time. And in those years, songs were performed by many different artists. But the Bing Crosby performed this one and a lot of other people. But the big hit recording was by Vic Damone. Hal also wrote a song called American Beauty Rose. You're doing pretty good with that, by the way. It's, it's going <laughs> I'm fine. still learning. <laughs> American Beauty Rose was written by Red Evans and Arthur Altman, and it was recorded by none other than Frank Sinatra. Hal was thrilled that Frank had recorded one of his songs so early in his career. He also wrote another song called My Heart is an Open Book with the music by Lee Pockras, and it was recorded by Carl Dobbins in 1959. He wrote with Sherman Edwards, a broken hearted melody, which Sarah Vaughn sang. And he also wrote uh, for Joni Summers a song called Johnny Get Angry. That was in 1962. Then he had his first number one hit. He wrote a song with Leon Carr, which was sung by Teresa Brewer and published by Shapiro Bernstein. 
It was called Bell Bottom Blues. It was 1953. <laughs> 19, 1953. That was a while ago. And his, his, as you said, his very first number one hit. I mean, that's a big, big deal. It was for him. Yeah. He got pretty excited about you, it. You hope that somebody will just buy one of your songs when you're writing them, and that's your job, and, and to actually go right to number one. Uh, it should be mentioned, by the way, Sherman Edwards, who was house composer you mentioned for Broken Hearted Me uh, Melody, and Johnny Get Angry, went on to write the Broadway hit 1776, of course. Lee Pockris wrote the music to catch a falling star. So clearly Hal knew what he was doing when it came to picking composers. That's right. A and that leads us right to the one that he is uh, really most known for working with. Of course, Burt Bacharach. These guys met in 1957. It was here in New York City at the now famed Brill Building. So much incredible music has come out of uh, that building right there in uh, Midtown Manhattan. Um, they were introduced to each other by Eddie Walpin from Famous Music. What happened at that point? <laughs> They had both been working with other people. Uh, at one time, Bert was the musical director for Marlena Dietrich, and he was also writing with other lyricists. But, and he was under contract to Famous Music. Hal was freelancing. But when Eddie introduced them, Famous Music gave them a tiny little broom closet of an office. There was an upright piano in it, a scarred desk for Hal to write in, and that was it. Hal used to bring snippets of lyrics in, and Bert would bring uh, a few bars of music in. they decide which one they wanted to work on that day, and that's how they started their collaboration. And despite those meager surroundings, they were able to crank out the hits. Uh, in fact, about a year later, or less than a year later, The Story of My Life, Marty Robbins recorded that in 1958. That was their first hit together. How long did they have to wait for their second hit? Because those don't always come right away, forever. <laughs> Well, in this case, it did. They, it was the same year that they wrote uh, the song which gave me the title of my book, and it gave Hal a big hit with Perry Como's Magic Moments. Hal was just ecstatic at having two hits in a row so early in his col collaboration with Bert, and he was fond of saying that there was nothing wrong in a songwriter's life that a hit wouldn't cure. <laughs> But <laughs> he went on to say that the flops he wrote after that, after those early triumphs, brought him back to earth, and there was nothing like a flop to cure a swollen head. I'm sure if there are any songwriters out there tonight, you know what he was talking about. That was just the beginning of this slew of mega hits that the two of them had, and we're talking about all types of musical genres. Uh, what an amazing wide array of artists, Bobby Vinton. Blue on Blue came after that, The Fifth Dimension, One Less Bell to Answer, Gene Pitney, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, uh, Dusty Springfield, Wishing and Hoping, and Sandy Shaw's Always Something There to Remind Me. All great songs, all great artists, and all hits. That's right. But I also want to mention Herb Alpert. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Herb recorded um, This Guy's in Love With You for a um, a special he was doing. And actually, the original song was This Girl's In Love With You. But Herb wanted to sing a love song to his wife, and he kept after Hal to change the lyrics. Hal hated to change his lyrics, but Herb persisted, and he finally got Hal to change it to This Guy's In Love With You. And it ended up not only Herb sang it, but Hal used to love to sing it to me, and of course, I loved to hear him sing it. And how fortuitous that he got together with Herb Alpert, because at that time, Herb is launching this new group that you might have heard of called The Carpenters, uh, needed some music, and it was a song from Hal David that got them on their way with their very first hit, right? It was their very first hit. Actually, Herb recorded um, close to you, but he didn't like the way it sounded. So he put it away in a trunk somewhere, but he had this new group, a brother and sister act, for his A&M records, and he was looking for something to give them for their very first song. And he pulled that song out, fortunately, and it was their breakthrough hit. It stayed at number one on the Billboard uh, one, Hot 100 was for four weeks, and it won them a Grammy for the New Artist of the Year. She had a great voice, oh, Karen. Amazing. She passed away much too soon. Much too soon. Uh, then, of course, came a slew of mega hits by a young lady 
by the name of Miss Dion Warwick. More on that in just a few moments. But talk to me now and tell everybody about Hal's writing process. What kind of zone did he get into, or did he have a special place he liked to write? Actually, Hal had a, a, an office that he went to for business, but at our home, uh, we shared an office and we each had a desk. And Hal would, if he received an assignment, he'd go to that desk. It was always piled with papers, notes, books, anything he could put on top of that desk, it went there. And the minute Hal needed to write something, he'd go to that desk and completely clear it off. It was quite amazing. You never got to see the, the top of the desk until he, Hal had that assignment. And I always thought it was sort of his way of clearing his mind because he never sat at that desk to write. This is where he wrote. <laughs> this was a rocking chair that I still have. It was repainted, restrung, recovered, and it was also used for an occasional nap. I think Hal must have considered it his good luck charm because that's where he did all his writing. And but, go ahead. No, <laughs> I no. just wanted to finish that because of his. Uh, uh, his writing style, he always described himself as a laborer. He worked at the lyrics. They didn't just come that easily to him. And sometimes he was very reluctant to let uh, a lyric or even a word go, but he was in a recording session and he had to just finish. The, time, the clock was ticking and he had no choice. So that's the way he wrote most of his songs. The, the song, What the World Needs Now is Love, which you're going to hear later on, took him three years to write. He lived in Roslyn. He would drive in from Roslyn to the city and kept thinking of what the world didn't need now, didn't need more of, until one day as he was driving in from Roslyn, he finally figured it out. But I hate to think of all those other motorists on the road while he was driving back and forth in those years trying to think of the right lyric. But, but literally, it's, it was that version of Road Rage <laughs> that, that, that brought, in, that, brought that lyric, right. that last, you know, that finished the lyric for him. You, you wrote something interesting in the book that I think anybody here who is an artist can relate to certainly, and, and whatever you do in life is when he would be anywhere and all of a sudden he would go away or he would get that vacant look on his face and people would refer to him at a dinner table or whatever. Well, Hal's working. That's right. He just sort of went to that, that place. He was not only working when he got that look on his face, but he was always listening for someone to say something that, that he could then turn into a lyric. And or, it, often, it happened frequently. Or cut him off on, on <laughs> right. LIE. Uh, of course, all those pop hits on the radio and so much work for film over the years. He went on to write so many memorable songs for films. Uh, I have to imagine at least I've heard uh, other songwriters talk about this, how they approach different types of writing differently. And I, I imagine he approached the songs he wrote for film differently than those that were to be pop hits on the radio. He did. And one of the most iconic songs that Hal and Bert wrote was for the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, raindrops keep falling on my head. Uh, it, it was probably one of Hal's uh, most popular songs. It was written over a 4th of July weekend. Hal was called in from New York and asked to come in and uh, perform this, uh, uh, see the, uh, the cut. The, the screening. Thank you. <laughs> the, the rough screening, because there was that one scene that, that where they wanted a song. But Hal got, by the time he flew in from New York, he was sick as a dog. He just didn't think he could make it. Called the studio to tell him he wasn't coming. But they said he had to come because it was a 4th of July weekend and they were closing down and they needed him there. So somehow or other, he dragged himself over to the studio, saw that scene, and uh, wrote the music and took it over to Bert, who had already written the, wrote, uh, Hal wrote the lyrics. He took it over to Bert, who had already written the music. And as they say, the rest is history. They won the Academy Award for that song in 1970, and that pretty girl in the background is Candace Bergen. She's the one who presented it How to great them. How that? <laughs> uh, they also wrote the uh, theme song for the film Alfie, Hal and Bert together, and, and do I have it right that that is Bert's favorite Hal lyric? That's right. Um, they also wrote songs for three James Bond movies. How cool is that? Tell me about those. Pretty good. <laughs> 
uh, Hal had a great friend by the name of John Barry who wrote, I don't know, maybe the music for nine of those uh, James Bond movies. So he called Hal to write in 1979. He asked Hal to write Moonraker with him. That was performed by Shirley Bassey. And be prior to that, uh, John and Hal wrote We Have All the Time in the World, which was from the film His Majesty's Secret Service. Hal took that title from the final words that James Bond uh, uttered in the movie. It was what his wife said when she was dying. And that was sung by Louis Armstrong. Unfortunately, he was ill at the time. That was the last movie he ever made. The James Bond series really started in 1968 with Casino Royale. Hal and Burt wrote one of their very famous uh, memorable film songs, The Look of Love. It was performed by Dusty Springfield and was a definite highlight of the film. And it went out on to have a spectacular life of its own. Do you have any recollection of the first time you either heard a song, you knew it was a Hal David song, and you're like, oh, wow. Actually, no, probably because I think like we're hearing tonight, I, think, I thought everything was Burt Bacharach. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't really until I, I started singing myself, and then I, I, I realized what the, the lyrics were. And now as a singer, it's all about the lyrics. That's the first thing I look for in a song. So, um, and I, I just think he's, he's a genius. And he was, he was so special. And, and he's just like the sound, certainly the soundtrack of my childhood and, and now my adulthood too. I, I mentioned, you, you mentioned to me backstage, I, I was curious if there was a particular lyric. You, you brought up a great lyric of Hal's. Oh, well, there's so favorites. many, but one that came to mind was, um, that I think is so great is, uh, one less bell to answer, one less egg to fry, one less man to pick up after. I should be happy, but all I do is cry. <laughs> How great is that? Can I just jump in for a second? Please. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned earlier that Hal was always listening, trying to find something that he could use for a lyric. He was in London and invited to a dinner party, and the hostess said to him, when you get here, don't bother to ring a bell. It'll be one less bell for me to answer. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. That's fantastic. So many uh, songs for film, so many songs for the stage. I want to move on to that right now because Hal David and Burt Bacharach were very well known for the music that came out of Promises, Promises in sure particular. Is. How did Hal get involved in this show? Hal always dreamt of doing a Broadway show. So when David Merrick called him, and asked him and Bert to write the music for the show Promises, Promises with uh, the book by Neil Simon. Of course, he just jumped at the opportunity. Uh, it, the show Promises, Promises was based on the movie The Apartment, which had starred Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine many years earlier. And it happened to have been produced by a good friend of ours, Walter Mirisch. We didn't know him at the time, but that was beside the point. We became good friends afterwards. Jerry Orbach was the young lead in the show, and he was actually, the show itself was nominated for a Tony, and Jerry took home the Tony that year for best performance by a leading actor in a musical. He later went on to star in the long-running TV show, Law and Order, but at heart, he was a song and dance man. And, and one of the great things about Hal's life, and you really get this from Eunice's book, is that his life and his lyrics weave their way through pop culture history. And Jerry's story is just one of those examples of that. But, but back to Promises. Promises for a moment. There is a, a great story you have uh, from one of the very memorable songs from that show. That's right. The opening act, uh, the second act in the musical, uh, Bert and Hal had written a song, and actually Neil had written a scene. They loved it. David Merrick loved it, the director, the choreographer loved it, everybody loved it, but the audience. <laughs> it just fell flat. So it was decided, how, uh, Neil had to sit down, and write a whole new scene, and Bert and Hal had to write a new song to go with the scene. But Bert was in the hospital with pneumonia. And he just, there was nothing he could do. David Merrick was tearing his hair out, but 
Hal sat down and started to write the lyric because he wanted to prove to David that something was happening. Well, the song turned out to be, um, <laughs> You. <laughs> I'll never fall in love again. It was sung by the Anshinu who had just broken up from having a, a big uh, affair with her boss. And she took sleeping pills because she was so upset. Uh, the, the young man, uh, in this case it was Jerry Orbach, came to his apartment where she was and revived her. And she grabbed his guitar and started singing, I'll Never Fall in Love Again. And once again, Hal, without really realizing it, used real life for, to help him write his lyrics because he rhymed pneumonia <laughs> with phonia. <laughs> and people tease him about the, that rhyme, but it has lasted a long time. Hey, army salami. I mean, come on. <laughs> where he got that stuff. That show ran for 1,281 performances, and the cast album won the Grammy Award for the best cast recording. So that was pretty good. Your connection to Hal and Bert's lyrics go beyond just appreciating them growing up and singing right. them in your shower. Right, you actually I actually were, got You were to... in a production of their music. Yes, um, I'm not sure how many years ago it was. Uh, maybe it was 10 years ago or so. I appeared um, in the Broadway uh, musical, The Look of Love. I did not sing that song in it. Um, <laughs> but it was a review uh, of um, the music and lyrics of Bert and Hal. And it was, uh, it was a dream come true for me to get to you know, be a part of a show that celebrated um, their music. And I remember Hal, I think Hal was just so tickled that we were doing this on Broadway. He came to so many rehearsals. <laughs> right. he, was our, he was our biggest cheerleader. And that was kind of the first time I got to, um, to kind of hang out with him a little bit. And he couldn't have been nicer. And um, I, I sent him a recording then years later, and, and he, you guys would come to shows I would do in L.A., right. and then uh, he asked me to sing at his 90th birthday party uh, with an incredible roster, including Dion. And um, so I've just always felt this uh, great fondness for him, um, and the times that we were together were very, very special. I can imagine what it was like for him sitting in the audience watching that. And I do have to ask you, because it, it brings to mind for me, what was it like? What was his reaction? Inevitably, you'd be in the car driving somewhere, and one of his songs would come on. <laughs> would, would he crank it up? Would he, would he turn the station? Would he, would he say, I really didn't like how they emphasized that particular <laughs> lyric? There. Never. He always loved hearing his songs. He just, he was so thrilled to hear them. Uh, really, he, he was just like a, a kid. He, he was always in Europe, wherever we were traveling, if one of his songs would come on and it, it was just terrific. Yeah, you get the impression he got a big kick out of <laughs> what he did and, and, and the difference between him sitting at his, in his chair and writing these songs, and then, wow, there it is. And it, he, that never got old for him, did it? Never. Uh, let's shift gears and go country for a moment, oh, shall okay. we? Uh, Hal, of course, had several country hits. Back in the 60s, he wrote a song with Paul Hampton that was Sea of Heartbreak. Uh, that was a big hit for Marty Robbins, who was a very popular country star right. at the time. That was in 1961 when that song be came a hit, but what happened with it in 2009, Eunice? <laughs> well, first of all, in 61, it was Paul himself who suggested the title of the song because he was going through a terrible divorce, and he told Hal he was drowning in a sea of heartbreak. <laughs> so that's how that came about. But in, uh, in 2009, before Johnny Cash died, he, he suggested a list of 100 songs that he wanted his daughter Roseanne to record. And one of those songs was Sea of Heartbreak. She recorded an album called The List, and Sea of Heartbreak became the number one song on that recording. She did it as a duet with Bruce Springsteen, and it was nominated for a Grammy. In fact, it became Roseanne's first top 10 album in, whoops, how do we get promises up there? Other way. I'm going to get you Maybe one. Maybe I went I the wrong way. There we there. go. There's Roseanne. Uh, 
uh, the, the song was nominated for a Grammy, and it became Roseanne's first top 10. I mentioned that in, in 22 years. So uh, Hal also wrote with North Carolina composer um, Archie Jordan. They did almost like a song that appeared in the film Bridges of Madison County. So that was another big hit there. And there's another song, and this goes back to something that Liz said, and I think a lot of people in the audience are saying, and, and I, as a self-proclaimed musicologist, said when I realized this next story, I had no idea Hal David wrote that <laughs> song. And I have a feeling a lot of you were saying that tonight. There was this blockbuster that he wrote with Albert Hammond again, working with Albert. Right. Uh, it became a hit for a major country icon and a guy who at that time had become this international superstar. You have to tell this story. Okay, I'm, I'm always happy to tell that story. It's a, it's a fun story. Uh, but first of all, I want to point out how being from Brooklyn when he was a young man, didn't hear many country songs. And he always said he didn't realize he was writing a country song, but country singers performed them and they became great hits for him. So he, he was really delighted. But this next song, Ab, uh, he wrote with uh, composer Albert Hammond, as AJ just said, and Albert himself recorded it, but it wasn't a success. Uh, Engelbert Humperdinck recorded it. It wasn't even released. And Bobby Vinton recorded it. It wasn't released. Hal was sure the song was a goner. But one day, Albert called him and asked him to send over the lead sheet for the song. And about that time, a fellow by the name of Willie Nelson walked into Albert's office, and he saw the lead sheet. He said, you know, I've always wanted to do a Hal David song. And Albert said, well, I'm sorry, this is meant for a new Spanish singer. He's a major hit in Europe, but he hasn't made it into the United States yet, and this is going to be his breakthrough song. And Willie said, well, I love to do duets. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how it started. <laughs> the, I, the, uh, an unlikely duo, if you ever saw one. <laughs> I just want to tell you a funny story that happened this morning. I was interviewed uh, on Fox Radio, and I forgot, like nobody said it to me like it was said to you this morning, uh, uh, when you walked in to please turn your cell phones off. It never occurred to me. So here I am, a live interview, and all of a sudden my cell phone rings. But my the, the ringtone on my cell phone is to all the girls I love you. <laughs> I should hope so. <laughs> so the interviewer wove that into the interview. Perfect. So you can tell it's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> so many great songs, so many hit records, uh, but I feel like there's still one whole chapter missing, so I do want to get to that right now so we can fill that in and it can be summed up uh, with one name, and that is Dionne Warwick. Would you please welcome <laughs> Ms. Dionne Warwick to the stage. Are you having a good time? I'm having a wonderful time. That Liz did pretty good, didn't she? Sitting in the back and watching and listening, and I'm going to have the best girlfriend's little bubble with regards to 99 miles in L.A. She will not be the first to have recorded as a female. I am. Oh, Liz, did I, you hear that? I already <laughs> recorded it, baby. <laughs> You're a little late. <laughs> Oops. Hey. All right. Well, it, it really is great to have you here. I and mean, I don't really think we could do an evening like this without Dion. And, and to, to be very clear, if you don't mind, may I run down your itinerary? You were uh, in yes. Venice yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you're here tonight for this, and you're flying off to London tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Thank you very ready? much. So let's, let's talk about when, when you first met Hal, it was 1959? Yes. How did that come about? Uh, how did that come about? Well, actually, I met Bert first. Uh, had a group that was doing a multitude of background sessions in New York, and one of the sessions we did was for the Drifters that uh, 
Bert had written a song with another songwriter, uh, Bob Hilliard, and it was called Mexican Divorce. And uh, we did the background for it, and Bert approached me after the session was over and asked if I'd be interested in doing demonstration records for uh, of songs that he would be writing with a new songwriting partner named Cal David. And he said, yeah, well, you know, as long as it doesn't interfere with my education, because my mother would kill you. <laughs> True. <laughs> and uh, as it turned out, that was my first encounter with Cal David. Wow. Well, what it led to is pretty incredible. Uh, some artists, get a little embarrassed when they hear all their stats, but I don't care because this is, this is just awesome. Uh, between 1962 and 1998, you charted 56 singles written by Hal and Bert. <laughs> that includes 22 songs that were in the top 40, 12 that were in the top 20, nine top 10 on Billboard's Hot 100. I actually don't think there's ever been a team that has ever topped that record. Can you? possibly articulate beyond how that level of success felt? You know, being on the road, first of all, you don't get an opportunity to even think about it. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think we really had time to think about it. <laughs> you know, uh, when I came off the road performing and doing you know, concerts and things of that nature, and they were ready to go into the studio again, uh, we would either meet at Bert's apartment with Alan and myself and Bert, and, or at the, God bless you, uh, <laughs> seriously, um, at the Brill Building in that little tiny office. My God. Yeah. I was listening to the description of that office, and it was so true. Yeah. I mean, we walked in this way <laughs> <laughs> and stood against the wall. <laughs> But it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah, a lot, a lot of really amazing energy surrounded that building. Oh, and, yeah. and you feel it to this day when you walk in there, even if you know the same thing's not going on. Uh, so first of all, now that you have some time to step back, even though you are so, so very busy, appreciate all of that success. Because, you know, or, or what it has done for the people uh, whose lives have been filled with joy because of uh, you putting your voice to those those songs. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's it's important wonderful. to do. Um, I, and I, I'm going to speak to Hal David. I absolutely adored him. Yeah. Hal was the stabilizing situation between Backrack and, and Warwick. And he was, <laughs> and Hal was in. <laughs> and that's, all, that's how he kept us calm. Yeah. And you know, every, Interview that I did, everybody of course said, Oh, Bert, 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 Bert. I said, Hey, darling. There's a man named Hal David. And if you didn't have him doing what he did, we'd all be humming. <laughs> 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 and that's the truth. <laughs> so, I am thrilled to be here this evening to be a part of celebrating. Oh, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> so, Celebrating. So let me ask you this, because obviously we, we know all the hits, and there was hit after hit after hit. It, it, it's hard for me to imagine that there were any flops in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there was a, a song called, in fact, it was the, the B-side of what actually became the hit record. There's a song called, I Smiled Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that was followed by a, a little song called This Empty Place. <laughs> <laughs> Massive hits. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no, we, we, um, we didn't jump out the box having hit records. It took a minute or two for people to understand, first of all, what we were doing. It was different. It, it was, was very different. It was completely different. We, uh, you know, Bert, being the musician that he is, a brilliant musician, I might add that too as well. He marched to his own drummer. Hal David, fortunately, had a way of writing words that we all, first of all, wish we had thought of first, <laughs> but had the inkling to be able to say. We didn't have to say anything, just 
put the record on, and you listen to what this man wrote for me to sing, and now that's my story to you. And I was fortunate enough to be the one that had the ability to bring it to your listening ear. So we, um, we were known as the triangle marriage that worked. Yeah. That was that, that's what the industry called us. Yeah. But we did have some bombs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they were far overshadowed by the hits. And, you know, a lot of those hits, uh, songs about love, Hal was uh, obviously best known for that. But he did other things. Well, we know he wrote that song about Salami and the Army. Uh, <laughs> but back in 1967, he actually did a protest song that you recorded called Windows of the World. The Windows of the World, yes. Which happens to be actually my favorite lyric of his. Oh, okay. It's. Um, it tells the true story, you know. The windows of the world are covered with rain. Where's the sunshine we all need? Everybody knows. When little children play, they need a sunny day to grow straight and tall. Let the sun shine through. He had a magnificent way with words. And um, although it really kind of had to stick the knife in and turn it. It was done with such class and style. You didn't just jab it, you just kind of eased it in. But he got his point across. Yeah. And that was the idea. Yeah, uh, that happens to really be one of my very favorite lyrics. Well, of course, we all know that there were so many awards and accolades that came uh, for Hal and for Hal and Bert together. Uh, we know they were recognized uh, for their achievements throughout their careers. Uh, and a number of those awards they, of course, shared with you, Dion. We do have this photo I want to bring up, uh, Eunice, with your clicker. There it is. Uh, this was taken at a Recording Academy event. I know they did receive the, Academy Accord uh, the Recording Academy's Lifetime Achievement Award. They also one time received the New York Heroes Award. And I have to believe that Hal was a real hero to you. No doubt. No doubt. He was probably one of the kindest human beings that I had the privilege of knowing and interfacing with. Um, he epitomized the word gentle man. That's what he was, a gentle man. Yeah, I loved him. I really did. Well, some of the other awards, uh, they went on to receive an Oscar, Tony nomination, British Ivor Novello. They were inducted into the Songwriters <laughs> Hall of Fame, of course, and that's an organization that Hal later chaired. He, he really struck me at, as a pretty humble guy, despite all of this massive success. How did he handle all of the recognition that he received? Well, I think I mentioned earlier, he was like a little kid when he received an award. He said he never, in his wildest imagination, except uh, anticipated receiving the accolades that he ended up getting. And he, he just coveted each and every one of them. He was especially proud. He was the first non-British songwriter to receive the coveted Ivor Novello Award. We went to London for him to get that, and the town just turned out for him. And he, he just couldn't have been happier. Well, something that I know completely tickled him was when he got his star on Hollywood Boulevard <laughs> on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. There it is, yeah. yeah. How great. <laughs> How fantastic is that? There's a great story there, too. The weekend of uh, October 14th to the 17th of 2011 turned out to be an incredibly special weekend for us. It began with his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and went on from there, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Hal was really jazzed that he was getting that star. The only thing, he was a little taken back by it because he learned that he was the oldest person to ever receive that award. <laughs> he was 90 years old when he got it. <laughs> Look at that smile. Uh, <laughs> So that weekend, you mentioned another big part of it was the Mark Taper Forum event in Los Angeles. And this thing, uh, not just Dionne Warwick, but really a who's who of the music biz and entertainment. We had an, an array of superstars. Uh, Stevie Wonder wanted to be in the show, but he was in Washington, D.C. for a Martin Luther King event the day before. And he wanted to come so badly that he chartered his own plane, 
arrived in Los Angeles just in time to go on stage. That's how much he wanted to show his appreciation for Hal. The others, of course, Dion was there, <laughs> Bert Backrack was there, Herb Alpert, Paul Williams, Smokey Robinson, B.J. Thomas, Jackie DeShannon. I, well, you can see there were so many more. It was just an incredible evening. It was produced by ASCAP's Karen Sherry. And everybody who, yes. <laughs> As tonight's show, by the way, was produced by Karen. Yeah. There were so many people there who performed. They all wanted to sing house praises. And he was just thrilled with the evening. Uh, Dion, how could you possibly pick which song to do that night? <laughs> which did you do? Oh, that was hysterical. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm sitting backstage and listening to my entire show being sung. <laughs> <laughs> By others. <laughs> exactly. And I, I finally, I, I said to Hal, I said, well, they didn't leave anything for me to say. <laughs> uh, am I supposed to dance now? <laughs> what, you, what am I going to sing now? He says, you're going to sing every single song that was just sung. I said, what? He said, yeah, you're going to sing every single song that was just sung. So an hour and 20 minutes, they got Dion Warwick singing all the songs they had just heard by somebody else. <laughs> it, it was amazing. We had the best time, I must say. We really did. And I got to also say that it, I, I paid tribute to Hal, based not only on the fact that he, he had been celebrating his 90th year, but um, I had to let everybody know that they're going to be some of the songs that you might recognize in another way. Nothing that will alter the lyric of Mr. David. I don't know how happy Mr. Backrack is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're paying tribute to Hal David tonight, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So none of his lyrics, Mr. Beat. <laughs> Mr. Backrack got a new list getting whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> and he was there in the audience. Yes, he was. He was right there. Uh, so not just all the big stars, of course, who want to sing his songs, but of course, throughout the years, Hal rubbed elbows with several presidents and first ladies. Give me a couple of highlights uh, from those experiences. When, for, when Nancy Reagan was the first lady, she wrote a book for her project called, uh, it was the Foster Grandparents Program. She wrote a, a book called To Love a Child. And it was suggested that maybe it would sell even better if it had a song to go with it. So she called Hal, and he in turn called a fellow by the name of Joe Raposo from Sesame Street fame. And the two of them wrote the song and called Nancy to come in from Washington, D.C. to hear it. Actually, they offered to go there. She said, no, you wrote the song. I'm coming to you. So this picture shows her wiping a tear. It wasn't because she didn't like the song. She was just so touched by it that she couldn't help but cry a little bit over it. And it was, it was a beautiful song. And then somebody had to record it. Well, Nancy's good friend was um, Frank Sinatra. Of course, she asked that he sing it. He did. They did. Everyone was thrilled with the song. And it was the, the book and the song were a big success. And speaking of Nancy Reagan, Dion, I think this was uh, yeah, 1983. Uh, she hosted a little party at 20th Century Fox in Hollywood for the Queen of England, yeah. uh, Queen Elizabeth. What was that like? You know, you were you were meeting Nancy Reagan and you're performing for the Queen. Yeah, well, I'd already met Nancy on several occasions. Um, her husband being president of the U.S. of A. He, um, he had appointed me the ambassador of health for the United States. The first and only, and he ain't given none since, and I know why. Because, let me tell you, it ain't an easy job. It's not easy at all, but uh, we, we got through that. When, we got the when I got the invitation to be a part of this particular show, it was amazing. It was Sinatra, uh, Perry Como, George Burns, I'm certain it was two other people that I can't remember, and myself. This is my second time I had performed before the Queen. And 
and uh, it was, it was, I mean, what can you say when you stand in front of Queen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was old hat for you by then, second time. Yeah. Oh, great. This evening joining us, Karen Sherry from ASCAP. Thank you very much. What a wonderful job putting this together. Everybody here at the 92nd Street Y, thank you so much for making this happen. A special thanks to Michael Kirker for joining us and also to all of you for being a terrific audience. This was a whole lot of fun. Uh, please join Eunice, who's going to be in the lobby signing copies of her book, Hal David, Magic Moments, always something there to remind me. Uh, certainly, if you haven't had a chance to pick up a copy of the book before the show, go online, go to Amazon, grab it. A lot of really cool, cool stories in there. We'll certainly be reminded of this evening for a long time to come. So, thank you. AJ, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>